I took his beautiful, like his sister had given him this Bible and I took this Bible that was highlighted and underlined with like little notes in the margins and I threw it on the ground and broke it in half. So that was a low point um, in my faith journey for sure. So Karen, when we walk into a bookstore, uh, there are all these Karen Kingsbury stories everywhere on all of the shelves, and people love reading them, but uh, we wanna know a little bit more about, about your story. Um, could I ask you, what was it like growing up for you as America's favorite inspirational storyteller? Were you constantly reading? Were you reading inspirational books? Give us the backstory. Well, I didn't really come into like a strong relational faith in Christ until I was like in my early 20s. So I was reading. I wasn't necessarily always reading the best things. But when I was young, it was Dr. Seuss. And that kind of Dr. Seuss sort of made me fall in love with storytelling, the creativity, the imagination that he had. I'd memorized the books like five, six years old. And I knew. Oh, like, yeah. The, the cat in the hat, thing book. one and thing two. The yeah, best. Lorax, like uh, the Horton Hears, all of it. So I think it was five when I first stapled together some pages and I was writing this story called The Horse, and I have no idea why. I not, <clears throat> never was one of those girls that loved horses necessarily, but I liked them on the other side of the fence. Um, but I think every word was spelled wrong and all the lines slanted downwards, but I had written a book. And the feeling was like nothing I had known at five years old, and I was hooked. And I've been telling stories ever since. And, and uh, talk about the point at which faith in God entered the story. Uh, I know it has something to do with your husband and going on a first date with a Bible and reading Philippians. Yes. Wow. All of the above. That, that sounds pretty yes. risky on a first date. I don't know. I mean, right. if I had done that with my wife, I don't know if she'd still be with me. <laughs> he was like, he's, the way he puts it, he's great. He says, you know, he was done with the, uh, we were in LA, met working out at the same health club. He used to come in the morning. I would come at night. But on that one day, you know, it just takes that one moment, he came to work out at night. And we had this, like, we met up, we just, like, you know, come to a conversation, knew some people in common, and talked for, like, three hours. So that was a big kind of first meeting. And then by the end of the, the conversation, he said, you know, I would love to take you out on a date. Um, would it be okay if I bring my Bible? And I thought, Kirk, I bet he was the weirdest. Like, that was the weirdest thing anyone had ever said to me, especially in L.A., he was like this good looking guy, just, you know, real athletic looking and very friendly and kind. I could, I was like this, you know, this guy just, he didn't, wasn't like a partier, I could tell. So I liked, I mean, I was living a clean life. I just didn't have a relationship with Jesus. I believed in God. I would remember feeling like I could see God's signature on the mountains because it was so beautiful. And I knew he was responsible for that, but that was about where it stopped. And uh, so, yeah, he brings the Bible to the house. Like, I, mean, I don't know if he's going to bring... You know, if he's coming on a bike or I, I, just, I had never heard of anybody bringing a Bible to a date, but I didn't want to lose him that quickly. So he shows up and he says, I thought we could read Philippians four. <laughs> like, I don't okay. know a Philippian, any Ippian. I'm like, what's an Ippian Philippian? I, I have no idea what this is, but I had to play it cool. So I said, yeah, sure, go, go ahead and start reading. So um, we get through and Of course, it's beautiful. I think I have most of it memorized at this point, but. But he's reading and I am not paying attention. I'm like so uncomfortable and it's this spiritual conviction and I'm, I'm not familiar with any of it. And um, I just knew I wanted to be done. So I kind of finally, I think I interrupted him and I said, are, are we good? Can we check that box? And then when, he kind of was like a little disappointed, but he's like, yeah, sure, we can go. So we went to, the, to dinner and movies and then for three months, we were like back and forth on the Bible. He kept bringing it up, bringing it to a date, wanting to talk about it. And finally... I don't know if you know this part, Kirk, but I took his beautiful, like his sister had given him this Bible and I took this Bible that was highlighted and underlined with like little notes in the margins and I threw it on the ground and broke it in half. So that was a low point um, in my faith journey for sure. We were outside in a parking lot by his car and we were in separate cars we had met there and he, he just picked up the pieces and drove away, kind of gave me a sad look. And just drove away. So all my life I'd been driving past Valley Book and Bible. It's not there anymore. But I had never gone inside because I just thought like weird, like what is that weird thing? And uh, so I went into this Christian bookstore and I I asked for a Bible in English. I just wanted, I, I, my only reason was to prove him wrong. And instead I got into the car 
with the Bible and a concordance, which I also bought. And, and I had been raised in a denominational faith that was, we had kind of had been marginalized by that point that we really never went to church. And just like everything I believed, I, I just couldn't find it. And God was speaking to me in that car. And he was, I could hear him say, like, you can either fall away with your man-made traditions or you can grab onto me and never let go. And so I grabbed and I've never let go. This, this sounds like a great story. Like the, like the beginning of a great <laughs> romance story between you and your husband. Uh, you should write a book. Then now how did you become a journalist? You, got, you, 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 you wrote that first book at five, but then you became a journalist and then you transitioned into fiction. I mean, how did, how did that whole professional thing kick in? Well, I, I think from the time I was 12, 13, I knew I wanted to be a novelist. Like I for sure knew that that was my number one choice. So being a journalist was, was plan B. And I got my degree at Cal State Northridge in journalism, you know, wrote kind of through high school, <clears throat> for the high school paper. And then by the time I was in college, my senior year, I was, um, I was actually hired by the LA Times to be a sports writer, of all things, which what in the world? I wasn't an athlete in school, um, but I had friends who played sports and I mm-hmm. had done feature stories on them. That doesn't mean I know the difference between an end zone and a touchdown. But I had to learn very quickly because I was hired by the Times to be a sports writer. Right. So off I was you know, getting getting high school game stories and walking the sidelines. And I, my dad would go with me. He would sit in the stands and he would take copious notes. He understood the game very well. And on the way back to the office, he would tell me what happened. Like, this is what it was. Okay. <laughs> These are the people right. who made the notes. <laughs> and I would take those notes. And I only had to write like an eight or ten inch story, like the equivalent of 200 words. It was nothing. But it allowed me to kind of get my foot in the door as a journalist. And then that led to um, doing feature stories. And then you switched to fiction. That's a big jump. Why did you get into fiction? Well, because my husband and I found out we were having a baby. And so it was like, okay, now I want to be home. I don't want to work 12-hour days for a Mm. newspaper. I need to write. And my husband said, there he is. Once again, the faith coming back to the surface. He said, Karen, I'm going to pray every single day that God will give you a way to write at home and make your living at home. And I just kind of rolled my eyes like that is not going to happen. I mean, I was making very little at the paper, but I I, I sold a story to People magazine during that time uh, that I had a a true story that I had covered for the uh, the paper. And it was they paid me seven hundred and fifty dollars. And I said, honey, I'm not going to make that like I'm not going to make my living at home. People magazine as big as it gets. Yeah. So, but he kept praying. He was undaunted, no, not unfazed. He was going to keep praying. And uh, the, the article that I wrote for the People magazine, uh, an agent saw it and he said, you know, con- contacted me. That'd make a great book. So I wrote a proposal, not knowing what I was doing. And he loved it. And he said, I'll be in touch. And three days before the maternity leave was up, he contacted me and he said, well, he goes, sit down. I've got great news. And he had gotten it into a bidding war between two secular publishers and allowed me to be able to. OK, so the, the advance was more than three times my annual salary. But he said, you'll only get a third of it when you sign it. I've, I've got to get my 15 percent. So I'm like, just like cut through the chase. Like, what is that first check? And he said, yeah, you'll probably only get one check for the first year because you have to cover the trial. It was a murder trial. It was a sad story. It wasn't fiction. Um, you'll only get the one, you'll get a check for signing the contract. And then not till you finish like going through the trial and writing the book could be a year before you get a second. So he said the first check and he told me the amount was $11 and 89 cents more than I made a year. 